Now my hare mai and welcome everyone to this webinar on cultural considerations in aged care, organized by Wonka, the World Organization of Family Doctors, and also supported by the University of Otago in New Zealand. My name is Tanya Morenhout. I'm the chair of the Working Party on Ethics and Professionalism at Wonka. And Dimitri will also introduce herself. Yes, welcome everybody. So my name's Dimity Pond, and I'm chair of the special interest group in aging and health for Wonka. I'm actually the outgoing chair, and we have a new chair coming in at our upcoming conference, Leon Geffen. It's an honor to introduce these three speakers to you tonight. Um, or this morning, or this afternoon, in fact, wherever you happen to be. And um, But first, I'd like to just start with a bit of housekeeping. We have a Q&A option, which you can get by um, uh, just hovering your mouse over the bottom of the screen. You will see a Q&A option. Um, and all attendees are invited to post questions there. Um, or any technical issues. We can see them, but uh, you will not be able to see a question unless we decide to answer it online. Um, the chat is disabled for um, attendees. Um, so if you've got technical questions or anything like that, just post them in the Q&A because we can see them. Um, lastly, this webinar will be recorded. Hopefully when you logged on, you will given that information, and it will be made available on the websites of our Working Party and Special Interest Group. So we're looking forward to hearing from our three speakers. Yes. Um, for those who are not familiar with our Working Party and Special Interest Group, we will post a link in the chat so that you can find our website and some more information. Um, and it's also a good time to remind you that the Wonka World Conference will take place in uh, Sydney at the end of the month. That will be from 26 to 29 October, and both our uh, working party and special interest group will present a workshop there and will also hold our um, annual meetings there. And we're keen to engage with both um, Wonka members and a wider global audience of people working in primary care on timely and relevant topics like we're doing today. Um, we're looking into ethical considerations of emerging technologies, um, how to teach ethics to medical students, identifying and managing uh, dementia and elder abuse. It's a wide range um, of topics. And of course, today we will talk about um, cultural considerations in aged care. And it's an honor to introduce our first speaker. Um, Haki Demir Kapu is a general practitioner and a tutor for GPs in training in Brussels in Belgium. His PhD work at the Department of Family Medicine and Chronic Care at the Free University of Brussels focuses on advanced care planning with ethnic minorities in uh, Belgium. He's also a coordinating and advising physician in Belgium's first culturally sensitive nursing home. And in his presentation today, he will explain how the nursing home operates and he will focus on the adaptations that they introduced to make it accessible for older adults uh, with uh, Muslim backgrounds. So the floor is yours, Haki. Hello, everyone. Um, as Tanya said, Safir is the Belgium's first cultural sensitive nursing home, um, which is responsive to the needs of all older adults by taking into consideration their culture, religion and values, uh, which results in personalized care. It's only a multicultural nursing home, uh, whereby the first two floors uh, from all origins, uh, Belgian, Spanish, Italian, uh, African, etc. But the third and the fourth floor is exclusively for Muslims. But the nursing home in general, it's really an inclusive uh, nursing home. Um, as you can see on the pictures, uh, on the third picture along the wall, um, we have illustrated the migration history of Belgium, whereby in 1930s, the Italian and Spanish people came to Belgium 
and then in 1960s the Belgian, the Turkish and the Moroccan people. So in this way, we will show them that they are really important, that they have also created Belgium um, because they worked in mines and in textile industry in, in really hard circumstances. So it's 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 um, a kind of showing their importance for us and for Belgium. Um, in our nursing home, we have really a multicultural staff across all departments. I will appoint in this point because uh, in some nursing homes here in Belgium, they say they are di they have diverse teams, but it's not always the true because the, the the people from other backgrounds are really in, for example, in cleaning teams, but not in all departments. And in our nursing home, we have, uh, for example, our directress is somebody from Moroccan origin or um, occupational therapist from Spanish origin. We have head nurses from Albanian, from African, from Tunisian origin. So uh, we show the diversity because in Brussels, we have uh, more than 180 nationalities. So we show it also with our team. And we have four official spoken language. So not only Dutch and French, but also Turkish and Arabic. And we use these languages in in, in leaflets, in signage, in buildings, in, in, in our social media posts. As you can see here also uh, some pictures over the wall in Arabic and in, in Turkish. Um, so the, the people who, who who are in our nursing home, they feel themselves also for, uh, welcomed because we are using uh, their language too. Um, we have adapted our facilities. Um, so each floor has its own dining and living room, uh, allowing respect for cultural diversity. You will see on the walls um, Arabic letters, uh, photos from Morocco, from Turkey. Um, we, they have all individual rooms with also private bathroom. It's not always the case in nursing homes. Um, they have foreign TV channels in different um, languages. Uh, we have also prayer rooms adjoined by a washroom for ablutions. Uh, on the ground floor, we have a, a, a ground cafe open to everyone. It is a central meeting place for residents and their families, but also residents of the neighborhood are welcome. They are coming, they are drinking, eating something. The, the members of different associations are coming and then talking with our residents too. Uh, in some cultures, family is really very, very important. And, and in cultures as with people with Turkish or Moroccan background, it's, it's really, uh, we try to, 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 to have a participatory approach to facilitate collective and individual wishes. So we um, organize res uh, regularly residents and family meetings, and we use their feedback to rearrange our planning and to review our functioning. Uh, it's important because it's first time that um, um, people from different non-Western migration backgrounds are coming in a nursing home and they don't know it. It, it is uh, in, in Turkey or in Morocco, okay, they know it, but in, in Europe, it's, it's the first time, uh, especially in Belgium. So we try to, to meet the needs of each person and, and to rearrange our planning. Um, um, we learn also, also all, every day. Uh, it's not we have this and you should uh, uh, follow our uh, rules. No, we are trying to review our functioning too. Uh, we take decisions with the resident and if the resident uh, uh, is agree uh, with the family too. The, we have adapted family visit hours. It means 24 hours, seven days a week they can come uh, they can uh, stay overnight if they wish. Um, most of all, in, in, in the beginning, they are sleeping with their parents too. Uh, they can eat together. Uh, we try to involve the family in care so they can give a bath to their parents. Um, they can cook together in our nursing room and they also participate to activities uh, because um, the first um, um, People, older adults from first generation, they don't know a lot of activities. Uh, um, so we try also adapt our activities and 
in, in the beginning, the family is also participating with their uh, parents. Um, during care moments, um, I say always to the caregivers, try to make small talks. So try to find out what makes them happy. It, it's the most important thing that they wish the residents to talk, to talk. And we should give uh, that we are interested in their life history. So tr we try to, to give time to specific also to the life questions, such as feelings of loneliness, loss of functions, depression, old age, and interpretation of the last stage of life. Um, try to ask to the residents how they want to be bothered. So uh, door closets, and sometimes they prefer genitalia covered, uh, um, especially with Mos Muslims. And if requested also for Muslims, men bothered by males and women by females, if it is possible, it's not always possible, but we try uh, to do our best. Uh, and we give also help uh, with ablutions before prayers. Um, there is also possibility of using water instead of only toilet paper in the toilet. It's, it's also important for some uh, people. Uh, so we ensure a bottle of water is always available for this purpose. Um, we have tailored meals, so we, we use a, a diverse range of herbs. So with similar ingredients, we have always two meal options. As you can see in the second picture, um, it's a turkey stick and butter and potatoes with parsley. But in the third picture, the same ingredients, turkey stew with olive princesses in a tagine form. It is known, well known for Moroccan people. Uh, we have a halal meals. It's also very, very important because these older adults have eaten always halal during their life. So they will continue it. Uh, so they can eat uh, even um, meat and, 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 and chicken in our nursing home because it's halal. Uh, we have Belgian beer, we have French wine, but also Turkish tea, Turkish coffee, and Moroccan mint tea. It's very important to them after having their meal they, that they can drink mint tea. Um, we have activities for all, so or animations, workshops, games, musical experiences, TV moments are all adapted to the habits and the language of residents. For example, we, we do Christmas market visits, but also henna workshop, as you can see in the second picture. Uh, it's well known for people from Turkish and Moroccan origin. Um, uh, as you can see on the photo right side, upper side, you can see dancing or residents are dancing to Turkish music. But just under this photo, we have also Belgian residents who are dancing in a nightclub. So it's activities really for all of them. Um, all religions are welcome, so our staff are, are allowed to wear headscarves. Uh, we have regularly scheduled visits by a priest at Sunday morning, as you can see in the first picture, but also from an imam uh, every Friday, as you can see in the second and the third picture, uh, he is calling to prayer and, and he read Quran. Uh, as you can see in the third picture, or, or residents on, the, on the wheelchairs, uh, they are listening to the Quran uh, from the Imam. So there are also possibility of fasting during Ramadan. We adapt our um, times, meal times, uh, lunch times for for the for the residents. And on the fourth photo, you can see a present given by our social assistant to a uh, resident uh, um, to celebrate end of fasting month Ramadan. In the upper photos, you can see so, uh, a Muslim resident who is uh, making a sign, a moon sign from, from Islam, and just behind him, uh, uh, another Belgian resident who are uh, making a, a cross sign from, sign from Christianity. So everyone is welcome. Uh, so we try to celebrate all cultural and religious feasts, so uh, Christmas, but also Eid al-Fitr is the end of Ramadan fasting month, as you can see in the first picture, but also Eid al-Adha festival of sacrifice, even the Chinese New Year. So we try to know uh, from which culture, from which religion are risen, and we try to celebrate also their uh, uh, religious or cultural feasts. Uh, we have, um, we organize Christmas meal with family members, um, but also iftar meal during the Ramadan fasting month. And uh, it's, it's very interesting. So during the uh, Ramadan fasting month, the 
people who are not Muslims, but who are in our resident, uh, residency, they participate also, as you can see in the first picture. And otherwise, in the, during for the Christmas meal, they are Muslims who are participating. So we live together all in peace. Uh, we work to, with local volunteers, so with associations in the neighborhood of our um, um, residency nursing home. So because there are a lot of communities from different culture and religions. So in the first photo, you can see they, they bake the uh, pancakes. Uh, they made it more than one meter and they have a record. And on and, and the right side, uh, the young people of an uh, uh, Moroccan cultural association who visiting our residence who making small talks with them and giving flowers. Uh, you can see a lot of activities that we are trying to organize with local uh, associations. Um, myself, I give regular cultural sensitive care trainings to our staff. Um, uh, it consists from Q&A sessions about religion, uh, what is halal food, ablutions, why they, they are taking and how they, they do it. Uh, about Christmas, sacrificial feast, etc., but also training on how to deal with conflicts uh, with family. Because what I, I'm experiencing in this nursing home, as it is first time, um, the family have a lot of high expectations from us. Uh, they wanted it, that's the same as home, but it's not always possible. Uh, and 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 other uh, uh, side the. Older adults are some, sometimes angry to their children because they say some, I have some older adults who say, I have seven children, I have raised up them, grew up, and, and even seven children can't look after me and they put me here in this nursing home. So there are some conflicts and it's always the, the, the staff who do, should deal with these problems. So I try to give training. I also uh, have a, a lot of meetings with the family and the residents to, to try to find a solution. Uh, also, also, there are residence ministers toward the staff uh, during the distribution of medications, et cetera. So I try to give um, um, training to staff how to deal with all these um, uh, issues. So that was it. Thank you for your attention. And if there are questions afterwards, I can try to answer. Thank you, Haki. That's great. Looks like a very interesting uh, project, and it's it's great to see how you can combine different uh, people from different backgrounds and, and cultures and religions um, together. And and you may just have found recipe for world peace. I think in that nursing home. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Joanna um, Hikaka. So she's a pharmacist and senior research fellow at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. She's a co-director of the newly established Center for Co-Created Aging Research at the university. Her clinical and research work focuses on older adults and Maori health, with a current focus on exploring Maori elder experiences and expectations in residential and community settings. Her presentation will address how aged residential care as a sector can provide culturally safe care options for Māori as they age by including Māori cultural values and practices. Great. Thanks very much for that introduction, Tanya. I'm just going to share my screen. Get over. Great. Okay. Um, I, so I'm going to talk today about age residential care and Māori in the context of Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, so I firstly wanted to start by just saying a big kia ora or welcome to everyone here. It's an informal way of saying hello in the Māori language of New Zealand. Um, and here you can see some Lord of the Rings scenery um, from the South Island in New Zealand. Just to provide a bit of context for those that maybe aren't as familiar with New Zealand as a country, New Zealand's situated um, in the southern hemisphere, sort of at the bottom of the world. Um, and the top right picture is a picture of you can, my daughter's tiny in that picture. She's climbing along the rocks about five minutes away from my house. And then in the bottom right hand corner is um the mountain that I whakapapa to so that I have connections to through my Māori heritage. Um, New Zealand has a population of 5 million and around 17% of the population are Māori or in, 
the Indigenous um, people of New Zealand. Um, and we see globally that there's an ageing population, the same as so in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, but what is what we see is that the ethnic um, diversity of those in the older adult age bracket is changing. So it's becoming more ethnically diverse. For example, although the New Zealand European population is going to increase by about 50%, well, increased by about 50% over that 15 year period, um, for the Māori population, it's uh, increasing by 115%. When we look at um, the population of older Māori, um, Māori are a younger age group than um, non-Māori in New Zealand. So um, the life expectancy for Māori is around um, seven to eight years lower than the life expectancy for non-Māori. And so that we see that reflected in the older adult population. So although 17% um, of the general population are Māori, there's only about 7.5% of the population 65 or above that are Māori. And when we get to age residential care, only about 4% of the total population of people in age residential care in New Zealand are Māori. So we can see that um, not only is the percentage small, but we know that the need for that um, age residential care is going to increase because of the increasing um, rate and the rapidly growing Māori population. So Māori will be, be becoming a large proportion of those that are in age residential care. Um, when we look at the type of people that um, are at a level that aged care would be appropriate in New Zealand, we see that 45% of those people with high care needs live in age residential care, compared to 75% for non-Māori. So what that's saying is that um, for Māori, 55% of those with high care needs remain in the community. Um, and some of those issues I'll come to later. So some reasons and barriers for age residential care I'll come to later. But one of them I wanted to touch on was similar to what Haki was talking about, the cultural expectation or the cultural sort of norm that family would look after their elders. Um, and so when people do reach that level of care where um, they could benefit clinically from um, aged residential care. There's that extra burden of it being seen as something that you don't do within your cultural norms or it's not how you should usually function. So for family, that pro um, provides, you know, uh, extra burden. Um, what we know, so the population's aging for Māori at a more advanced rate for non-Māori um, due to the earlier onset of chronic comorbidity in Māori, um, uh, due to a range of socio-economic um, factors, the, there's going to be almost a 200% increase in those that have high-level care needs for Māori compared to a 75% increase for non-Māori. So um, again, we see that the proportion that will need aged residential care or that level of care will increase dramatically over the next um, 10 to 20 years. Um, the predictors for entry into aged residential care differ a bit between Māori and non-Māori. So in New Zealand, we see that Māori, if they're older age and living alone, they're predictors for entry to aged residential care, um, compared to non-Māori where it's actually more around the functional um, dependence, so dependence in ADLs and um, higher rates of poor or um, fair self-rated health. Um, I co-authored a report a couple of years ago now for the New Zealand Health Quality and Safety Commission, which looked at older Māori and age residential care. So we sort of collected all the data that was available um, in the grey literature and publications to understand the context of, um, of Māori and aged care, and also discussed um, with people working in the sector about their experiences, did some case studies. So I'm just really um, alerting you to that and the references there if people are wanting to look at more detail. Um, certainly two years ago, that was about the everything in that report is, was the sort of extent of the literature available around Indigenous health in New Zealand and aid residential care. 
Um, and I think Haki gave a great presentation of, you know, how things can look if you take into consideration the, the um, cultural norms of living. Uh, and what um, one of the quotes from one of the people who participated in um, that report, they said, kaumātua, and that's the Māori word for older people, um, need to see, hear and feel the presence of Māori cultural values and practices for Fano or for family or for themselves to be able to thrive in aged residential care. So um, really that absence of um, seeing those cultural values, those Māori cultural values in aged residential care prevents people from coming into care and present, prevents them from feeling safe when they um, do need to enter into care. So what are some of the barriers? Um, Haki talked about uh, how the, the workforce sort of reflects the different cultures that are in their care facility. And certainly when we look at um, the care staff that work in age residential care, Māori are again not likely to be those involved in the care staff. Um, and so there needs to be a workforce development in terms of um, bringing up Māori care providers, but also increasing the understanding of people that are working in aged care in New Zealand. So in New Zealand, we have a lot of um, people that were born outside New Zealand working in aged residential care, so may not have been brought up being exposed to Māori cultural norms and values. Um, there's a lack of... Māori governance and leadership um, in age residential care and so often um, if there are any initiatives which incorporate Māori cultural values they might be dependent on a particular person being there as opposed to it being the sort of business as usual standard practice for a facility. Um, as I said, there was that um, variation in cultural norms. Funding models can be difficult so um, the New Zealand government does pay for some people to be in age residential care, but it's means or asset tested. So depending on how much money you have, um, if you own a house, for example, you might have to sell your house to go into age residential care. And this can have more of an impact on Māori families when there's higher rates of intergenerational living. So if the grandparents own the house, the parents and the children might have to leave um, to be able to afford age residential care for that person. The other complexity is that there's um, there's uh, land or housing tied up potentially in um, in tribal trusts and or family trusts uh, and so it, it becomes quite complex and when you add in the fact that um, for Māori who have been colonised who have had land um, taken uh, in, in a historical context, when um, that's added into, you know, now at the end of life, we're having to give up our land, give up our um, resources, which we've fought for through generations, then that adds to the complexity of um, the situation. Um, in New Zealand, there's sort of not really, in practice, a flexibility of admission. So it's seen as a one-way one, one, one way door. So once you enter into age residential care, it's hard to come out again. Um, high proportions of Māori live rurally and there's increased, um, there's reduced access to age residential care facilities in those rural settings um, and reduced choice. Um, and also the question of ageing in place. So for Māori who might, um, I talked about my connect, tribal connection to my mountain. It's actually in a different location to where I have lived for the last 20 years. And, but for some Māori, returning home means returning back to ancestral lands where and, and maybe um, age residential care facilities aren't available there. Um, so that's just a resource again um, for uh, just to show, I guess, another reference for people if they're interested, but also that these issues that I've talked about are similar to other indigenous populations around the world. Um, I just wanted to mention three types of cultural practices that this facility has um, introduced into their age residential care facility. Um, so the first one is porphyry. So when people are traditionally welcomed into a, a, ma a marae or a Māori meeting house or traditional community, um, there's a porphyry, which is a formal process of welcome. It involves song, it involves speeches, it involves the people that are 
already living in one place welcoming visitors and so this facility has a formal welcoming process for their um, residents so they get to come in with their families the songs that they like are sung people know about them and they find out about a bit about themselves they and they find out out um, things about the staff and the people that work at the facility and similarly when people leave a marae or that traditional meeting house there's a formal farewell and so this facility has instigated a formal farewell process when people leave um, often because they've passed away um, where again there's a formal goodbye and it gives the family um, a chance to say goodbye to the staff members but the staff also to have a formal process of um, sort of um, officially ending that relationship with that person. Um, and then thinking about um, the potential for other types of care models within um, for Māori is important, I think. So um, what does care at home look like? How can family be better supported to care for um, people that have high level care needs? Um, that second word, papakainga, is a traditional way of living where it's around um, all generations living on in sort of a home environment. So you might have sort of 10 to 20 different houses um, and people living together and living in community with each other. Um, and work I'm doing at the moment is investigating what other models of care could look like, um, both within the age residential care setting and outside the age residential care setting. And I think the other thing is trying to balance for people that under, at the moment, a lot of Māori feel that they have to make a choice between going into age residential care or having their cultural values valued or upheld. Um, and so how do we provide that high level of cultural safety within the age residential care um, setting so that they can benefit from the clinical um, aspects of age residential care? I'm just putting this in there in case anyone's interested in learning more about the Centre for Co-Created Aging Research. We're looking to collaborate um, and internationally as well. Uh, and so our focus is on um, addressing ageism in its widest sense. Uh, and so that's there if anyone's interested. And I'm happy to answer questions at, uh, at now or later. Thank you very much, Joanna. That was really interesting. And there are some questions, but I think we might come to them at the end, if that's okay. So I'll now introduce uh, Danica Rota, who is a family doctor in Slovenia. She's coordinated several international projects, including a European-led international study on improvement of older patient involvement in medical care. It's called IMPROVE. She's the head of the working group on palliative care of the Association of General Practice and Family Medicine of Southeast Europe. Danica will focus on health care for older refugees, presenting the results of field work in a transit centre, Chantille. I hope I got that right, Danica. Um, Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I hope that we hear each other. So um, I will uh, present uh, the, my work at Chantille uh, Transit Centre. Uh, for migrants uh, from 2015 uh, and 16. Um, I shall say that this year we have the same number uh, of um, migrants uh, passing Slovenia, my uh, country. Um, we have 2 million inhabitants um, in Slovenia and um, as I said, the comparable number um, passed um, is passing Slovenia this year as well. Um, in comparison with 2015, um, there were um, bigger groups, the transport were better organized, um, but uh, today they pass themselves walking, mostly walking through or um, taking bus, for example. So um, these are the pictures I saw in a live in 2015. Uh, um, and um, I was working and researching under the tent. Um, 
in which medical care was organized. Uh, there was also another um, reception center at Brižice, um, but as I said, I worked at Chantil. Um, at that time, Schengen border was uh, between uh, Slovenia and Austria. As you know, uh, now it is between uh, Croatia and Bosnia. So nowadays, uh, there, we do not have um, Schengen border anymore in Slovenia. Um, yes, uh, these are the routes from, um, from 2015. But uh, more than just uh, statistics, it's important for me as a primary care uh, physician that we have to care about human suffering and uh, we have to help uh, to people, uh, especially the vulnerable groups. And um, the problem is because um, we don't know exactly what is to be a homeless, what is to be um, a migrant, uh, what is to be a um, disabled per person. So we have to uh, learn ourselves and we have to learn our staff. Um, as Haki said, that he's educating um, staff in Belgium. Uh, here is the article we published um, in a journal. If somebody wants to read it in complete, um, just have to open it. Um, and here you can see um, all those people who passed. Um, I still remember that um, the problem with food, for example, we gave them a lot of food um, and uh, there was uh, conserved meat. So um, these um, food um, were left here because they don't know what is inside, what, uh, what is the specification of this meat. So they, for example, they took biscuits because it was clear more or less, but um, all this um, um, food with meat, uh, they left it. I, and I believe that uh, everybody would do the same um, link to uh, his or her person, personal religion. So um, we did um, a research, as I said, um, we asked the people and we asked medical staff um, about their experiences with healthcare. Uh, for elder people, we used pictograms as for all of them. Um, and um, we, um, we had the translator, um, uh, her, his name was Mohammed, but when Mohammed was absent, uh, this was in the afternoons and in the evenings, um, we had to do for ourselves without translator. So um, translator was not uh, with us all the time. So um, that was the, the other problem. Um, and um, we found um, five um, main areas uh, which uh, we should cover in the future, we think. Um, and these problems are um, language barriers, um, then um, traumatic experiences in the past in the, or in their root. For example, um, some of them, they talk about uh, passing Serbia without having a chance to go to the toilet. They had to stay in the past all the time, uh, older, younger children, everybody. So they told us um, how, did, how they've solved these uh, hygienic problems. So um, they, were, they had traumatic occurrences in the, in the root and in the past. Then in some um, regions, they meet uh, negative um, attitudes among health workers. Um, and of course, there were also uh, cult cultural uh, differences. Uh, major health problems um, were linked to war and travel. Um, they had a brutal wounds, some of them. For example, um, our perception before we start to work with them um, was that um, their health system was not so developed as ours which is not true. So um, 
some of the passengers, some of migrants, they had mobile phones and they showed us um, what happened with this with their um, orthopedic or um, trauma operations. They they had everything on mobile phones, the pictures of uh, hip, or so they they showed me. Um, um, uh, I worked as a health worker, as I said. So um, first of all, we we saw that um, they were not so bad equipped. Um, mental health problems, um, for example, um, we we met some people um, with uh, psychosis, and some uh, persons who accompanied them. They gave us um, a sort of uh, writing from um, from Greece, for example, what happened there. And they wanted to pass um, faster than the others because of their um, mental problems. And uh, we couldn't help them because there was no um, accepted, um, um, accepted um, professional recommendation. What shall we do with those uh, uh, with those people from subgroup of people with mental problems. So we had to adapt on site um, quickly as we uh, found it. Um, and in that time, I started to write to Ministry of Health that we have to solve, to solve the, this problem. We have to prepare for the future. We have to prepare uh, uh, guidelines, recommendations, everything for uh, such situations. Then, um, of course, we had uh, problems with pregnancy, but linked to the elder, I would like um, to underline that they didn't want to stay um, in Slovenia, in our um, place, um, even, they, if, even they were uh, very seriously ill. They want to go together with the family to the final destination, which was uh, Germany and uh, Nordic countries. So they asked us, they cried, uh, let us go. Don't hospitalize us. Uh, we have to go with our family. Um, we also found uh, differences between different countries. For example, uh, in Austria, they took x-rays of lung because they were more afraid of tuberculosis. In Slovenia, we didn't take x-rays for those who, uh, who had coughing problems. Another um, problem with elderly and elder migrants were that, they, as I said, they couldn't speak um, English and uh, mostly their grandchildren translated um, about their health problems, which was quite problematic, especially if there were um, gynecological problems or um, other problems which um, older people didn't want to, to um, expose to younger. Um, and um, also, as I said, in the afternoon, we didn't have translator. What our um, professionals um, spoke about this time, um, they said that, um, Speaking English was a problem, of course, and um, uh, young um, and minors could speak English much better than elderly and also even better than 25 plus. So they helped in translation in, in Brigitte everywhere, everywhere. Um, then um, also they uh, found that um, mostly children and um, older people were brought to um, to our health units. Uh, sometimes larger families came. Um, mostly we didn't have health records from a previous um, route and um, we had to discover everything again. Uh, mostly I, I can say that um, when I was working first, um, Young uh, females and men came and um, they explored the situation. Uh, they talked with us and then if they found that you are a trustful person, um, they brought uh, elder 
people. So um, I still um, remember one engineer, female engineer from Syria. She came um, to talk about um, um, causing problems. And then when she found that I'm a trustful person, she came after a half an hour with her grandparents and said, look, now we will speak about their problems because I can speak with, with you about this. So the trust is very important. Sometimes we had to took um, care of uh, 120 um, patients, uh, ill or um, disabled migrants per day, and, but sometimes just for 20. It was different. Um, so because of this experience, um, myself and some friends of mine, we started movement to prepare medical um, translating tool. And we, we gave um, um, tools, um, especially with medical vocabulary in Arabic, Farsi, Russian, Chinese, Chinese Albanian, French and English uh, language. So here you can see, um, we started step by step. So um, how the person enters and uh, you say hello, and then how to proceed, how to take an anamnesis, how to make a checkup. So every step is here um, in these languages. On the right hand side, there are also pictograms. So if you don't have anything, you can show with your finger. So this is the result of our um, work at Schengen border. Um, we did, uh, we published and uh, distributed uh, these um, vocabularies for health workers. Uh, we also did um, in the past many workshops, um, but um, last years I would say after COVID everything stopped. And I'm still disappointing, disappointed that uh, we didn't re refresh these uh, these workshops. So COVID stopped our um, our attitudes, our mission to to um, raise awareness uh, of cultural uh, differences in health workers groups. Um, we need education of health workers in the future, as I said, um, and primary care is the best place to do this because we are most accessible in comparison with hospitals. Um, of course, uh, there are extreme other vulnerable groups, um, as I said, people with mental diseases, people um, who were... Um, abused, for example, um, in, the, in their route. So um, we have to, um, to get knowledge how to approach these people. Uh, so um, this is just a glimpse of um, my work um, in the past. And I'm, I'm sorry that we didn't document more. After uh, eight years now, um, I found it that we have uh, to document our uh, work um, at primary care because um, it, can, it can come back and it can help us in the future. So uh, thank you for your invitation and um, I'm, I'm here to uh, answer the questions. Thank you very, very much, Danica. That was fascinating. And in fact, all the presentations were fascinating. And it's good that you've been able to document this, Danica, at least in this webinar as well, as in the publication that you did. Um, we do have some questions. And I think, Tanya, the first one is one that you would like to answer. Um, or at least um, post to Joanna. All um, right. Sure. Question saying, generally, in your experience, do our children of Kama to our aged Māori individuals prefer to care for their aged parents themselves, or would they prefer to sell their parents' home so that they can then afford to go into residential care? Sure. So I guess 
there's lots of things going on in that question. The first I'd say is actually, actually probably in most cases, the older person's decision themselves, uh, whether they their house is sold, not necessarily their children's because, you know, we're still talking about people having capacity a lot of the time to make decisions like that. Um, and I think that it's, it's a complex situation. So the decision wouldn't just be about the financial thing. It's actually, do we have the resources to be able to provide a really good quality level, you know, high quality level of care at home for this person because that obviously has financial implications in itself um so you know for some people that might be at, at um age residential care level it could take six to seven people on a rotating system sort of schedule to care for that person well in their own home um, and to not be completely burnt out and to still be able to you know engage in things outside of the home so um I think it's it's tricky it's not one you know you can't sort of say yes or no it's certainly not um I think that if people are wanting to look after their, fa their family they'll do that until they can't do that anymore and then the you know the implications of selling the home would be have to be taken into consideration. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Following up from that, there were a couple of questions in the Q and A that Hucky has already answered, but sort of about the financial implications because it's a private home. You specify that they need to pay about sixty five euros a day. Do you find that there's there are financial barriers to uh, to people to to live in in that type of residential care? Is that is that a struggle? Um, yes, for some people it's a barrier, but um, for people from uh, migrant backgrounds, non west migrant, as they have uh, many children, so they can participate each of them. So it's it's okay. But uh, as we know their pension they get from, from the government, it's not so much, it's not enough because they should pay, um, I think, uh, around 1,800 euros, between 1,800 and 2,000 euros, and their pension, um, I think it's 1,300 or 1,400 euros. So in most cases, the children um, are helping their parents. And, and other Wise. It is also some um, a good practice because they feel themselves guilty by placing their uh, parents in a nursing home, but maybe by paying a, a, little, a little bit, uh, it's also good for them. They feel them good also. So we have another question also um, for Joanna about uh, co-create. Oh um, yes. Edge. Sorry, I was busily trying to type it in the in the chat. Um, but we um so we're always interested in um collaboration internationally because I think everyone can learn from each other. So understanding what you know goes on in one place. So I've had lots of interesting ideas from both Danica and Haki today, just listening into what's happening. Um, and but our center is trying to promote people to work together. We're a transdisciplinary center, so not just health, but you know in terms of addressing ageism in its broadest context we um uh, we have you know engineers architects housing town planners um urban designers it um tech solutions mathematicians creative artists and practitioners um so we're sort of all sorts of people joining together to um i guess tackle ageism and um improve uh, well-being with older people so the other thing is that our center really centers on older people and um, older people driving decisions for the research center how we do things why we do things what our research priorities are um, and how we might um, sort of solve issues that are raised uh, I see another interesting question for um, Haki um, around intimacy in the nursing home. Are there any specific actions undertaken for couples who would like to be intimate? Things like double bits. Is there is that on your mind? Yes, we have also VIP uh, rooms. Uh, so it's it's uh, double rooms uh, where we have more space, and when there are couples who will. Uh, sleep together and in the same room it's possible and we have uh, some of couples who are staying together but we have also couples who don't want to stay together 
So in a separate room, really, it's it's exist also. <laughs> I actually have one more for uh, Danica, if I may, because I see that your work was absolutely um, very relevant in that huge uh, migration wave in um, or refugee wave, I have to say, in, in 2015, 2016. I, I think we see the same thing happening now when, it, when I look at the news, European migration, you see that there, there have been many lives lost at sea. And it's sort of become, it, it sort of lost um, a lot of attention in the media, but it's it's still, there are big migration waves. Um, do you have, have you done any further work on um, refugees, especially then related to, to older adults uh, more recently after COVID? Because you mentioned that it was a bit of a struggle during COVID that it, it has sort of decreased or attention has decreased. Has that, has that changed mm -hmm. recently? Um, we succeed to make uh, one lo local um, center for families at Logata. It's um, uh, 100 uh, kilometers from Ljubljana. The, that place is well organized. But in Asylum Center of Ljubljana, which I visited for many times, because they found myself as most equipped with experiences, um, they didn't... Um, implement uh, the recommendations uh, so the the health uh, care of uh, those in asylum is still um, not so um, well organized i would say um, and um, there is there they didn't implement um, things uh, which were um, suggested um, so uh, it's now uh, eight years um, and uh, the time is quite long, uh, so I expected that they, they will do it. Um, now we have a substantial problems because um, people um, are at Anzilum are so numerous that some uh, sleep outside, they say, outside the, how, the, the building, which is not acceptable for me. So um, I'm sorry that they didn't hear that politician so at one place, more rural, be organized quite well for families, but for other, um, we were not successful. And we have another question for you, Danica, from an attendee uh, who says, I've encountered quite a high suicide rate in rural or poor socioeconomic communities and higher mental health issues are likely. Do you notice this amongst your um, community or your the people? Mostly, that... mostly we uh, we see uh, mental health problems, um, and um, maybe a suggestion for Vunka. Um, um, young doctors and nurses are afraid of uh, meet uh, these complex problems, so they even don't want to. To go at their homes because they they are afraid, yeah. um, and um, we have to equip them. Um, so some people um, do they do not see you know, a nurse or a doctor for more than a year because they don't have transport. They are afraid, um, and uh, it's it's quite uh, really a big problem as you mentioned in your question. That's really good, and it just raises the um, importance of the work that both the special interest group and um, and the working group are doing, and Wonka generally, to try and improve our quality of care for people. Uh, Tanya, I think we need to draw to a close now. Would you agree? We do. Time flies. Um, thank you so much, uh, Joanna, Haki, and Danica, for Great presentations, very inspiring, I think. And as you said, Joanna, I think we can learn a lot from each other and from the projects that are happening in internationally in different countries and different approaches. So I hope this was an opportunity for the participants and then also for the attendees to learn from these projects. Um, once we have the recording, I'll share that with um, everyone who has registered for uh, the webinar, but thank you so much and wish you a lovely day or evening. Thank you, thank you everyone. Bye. Bye.